It's a never ending thing. Good morning. It is good to see each of you here this morning as we get ready to come and praise God this morning through song and uh, just through worship. It's uh, good to have you because you're a visitor with us this morning. It's so good to have you. And uh, this morning we're going to uh, be praising with our flag team this morning as we uh, go into our first song. So we're going to be uh, just worshiping God. So um, this morning right here, I tell you, I'll let you guys sit down so you can see what's going on. And uh, we're going to uh, go ahead and get into praise. It doesn't mean you don't sing, okay? So we're going to be starting off with This is Amazing Grace. Let's praise God this morning. this morning we've seen a couple of those just right here in this first song 
And Lord, as we raise our hearts and our hands and our and just our minds to you, Father, as we praise you with flags and instruments, Father, and our voices, we just we just thank you, Father, for having the ability to do this and to show you how much we love you and how much, Father, we just uh, we care for you and, and, and thank you for what you have done for us. Lord, help us to go through the rest of this service, Lord, to just worship and uh, praise your holy name. In Christ's name, amen. Tell you what, why don't you guys stand up for just a minute, greet your neighbor, say hello, and then come on back and stay standing and we're going for our next song, okay? Hey. Let's give our flag for a round of applause this morning, guys. Hey.
something that triggers that memory. I have a memory of something that most of y'all probably don't have any clue about Tropical Storm Ornesto. It happened 13 years ago, yesterday. Why do I remember that day? Why do I remember that name of that storm? My youngest daughter was born that day. The tropical storm caused the barometric pressure to drop and or Stephanie into labor and we went to the hospital about four weeks early. I remember the name of that storm because of that day. You know, God 
told the Israelites several things to remember. Let's look at Exodus chapter 12, verse 24. And this is talking about the Passover. After he's given all the instructions about the Passover, he says, Obey these instructions as the last in ordinance for you and your descendants when you enter the land that the Lord will give you as a promise, as he promised, observe this ceremony. And when your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean to you? Then tell them, it is the Passover, sacrifice of the Lord, who passed over the house of Israel in Egypt and spared the homes when he struck down the Egyptians, when the people bowed down in worship. He also, in Exodus chapter 20, Verses 8 to 11 said, Remember the seventh day and keep it holy. Six days you are to labor and do all your work. But on the seventh day is to be a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your sons or daughters, nor your male or female servants, nor your animals, nor any foreigner, residing in your towns. For six days you, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the seventh and made it holy. The Israelites did pretty well about remembering these dates and times. They slipped from time to time. And things would come back around where they would remember them again. But God also gave us a, um, something we should remember and something we celebrate this morning as we come together. And I'm going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 and read what, what it is we are to remember this morning as we gather. This is Paul writing here. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. God well knew how forgetful we were. In Acts chapter 20, verse 7, we see Paul waiting over in Troas to meet with the brother on the first day to meet around the Lord's table. God knew that we would forget so easily the things that were not significant. Christ's death on the cross was very significant. He didn't want us to forget it, so he gave us this Lord's Supper. This bread, to remember that broken body that was so brutally beaten. And this fruit of the vine, to remember that shed blood that poured out of his body as his body was ripped open and as the nails were driven in his hands and feet. So as we prepare to take this, partake this morning, let us not forget the sacrifice that Christ made there on that cross for us. Let us go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for being so mindful to know that we would forget so easily that you gave us this Lord's Supper to remember the sacrifice that Christ made there on that cross at Calvary for us. And Father, each one of us are sinners and need this, needed his sacrifice, needed his love. And Father, we just ask now that you will be with each one of us, that we will remember Jesus' suffering, his body that was broken, and his blood that was shed for our sins, Father. Of course, in Christ's name we ask all things. Amen. Come partake when you're ready.
dirty that God can't make clean and we're all made in his image so as you come here this morning whatever brought you here uh, we're so glad to have you if it is your first time with us uh, we want to welcome you and we're so glad you're here um, you may have taken all you had I say a lot of times to come through that door for the first time or maybe give God a second chance because you've been what they call church hurt or people hurt or something like that but you see that's what Satan wants us to do is to stay away from the one that can heal everything so we're so glad you're here this morning if you are here this morning for the first time or you've been coming for a little bit and you had to fill one out, you'll see one of the connect cards there in, the, in front of you, in the back of the chairs. Please fill one out. Um, you can drop them at the welcome booth out front um, and just let us know how you found out about us. We want to say thank you for coming. Uh, if you have any prayer requests, if anybody has prayer requests, you can always put them on those cards and drop them up there as well. But it's so good to see you and your family here. At this time, we're going to go ahead and dismiss our kindergartners through our fifth grade on back to Binge. Um, he's waiting back there, so our junior church can head on back. If you're new with us, we have junior church each week. Um, the last Sunday of the month, we hang out together, and the kids sit here with us. Um, we always have nursery available back there at the window. Bathrooms are in the corner on that side over there. We have our toddler class for those that are two and potty trained up through five. Um, and they have a great time over there each week with the teachers, and you'll probably hear them before it's over, but that's okay, too. Uh, this Sunday, we start a new sermon series, and we've got a bumper to go into that, but we're really looking forward to it. Um, because we're going to kind of debunk some of those lies that Satan tries to tell us. So let's, uh, let's do a series. <laughs> talk about uh, who we are and we define that in many ways uh, to other people they ask them well, oftentimes what we do or they say uh, you know where are you from or uh, you know who are your parents and we define ourselves in many different ways um, but we're going to look at in this coming month uh, some of the lies that Satan uses uh, to help uh, I guess to just steer off, off the wrong to the wrong path and uh, we're calling this mind games. The first lie we're going to deal with today is I'm not meaningful. Uh, part of the text that kind of introduces us to the whole series, we're going to look at this text in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 3 through 5. Um, and let's look at that uh, together to begin with. It says, though we live in the world, we don't wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Now, as you read this passage, I don't know about you, but there are just certain terms that just kind of jump off the page at you. You, you know, wage war. You've got weapons that are there. You demolish the strongholds that are going on. And so it seems that if Paul is almost transported, if you will, to the front lines of a battle scene, you can hear the guns you know, going off in the distance, the bombs exploding, you smell the smoke that is all around you. And, and I believe he's done this for our benefit to help us realize there's a battle that's going on for our mind. That's what's happening. It's taking place at this very moment, uh, right now. And Paul kind of compares our mind to a fortress, to a stronghold. And this battle that's raging within our mind, 
the devil's trying to take us prisoner. He's trying to take our mind and, and make it his, if you will. He wants that to be his headquarters. He wants to set up shop right in your head. And, and that's his target. Now, his war, his plan, his strategy is mind games. And so that's why that's our focus this month. Why would the devil be so interested in your mind? You think about it. The answer is simple. If you can control our mind, what can he do? He can control everything about us. Uh, because the mind is the center of who we are. Uh, the writer of Proverbs put it this way. He says, for as a man thinks in his heart, so he is. And so if you get us to think wrong, um, you know, the old saying, you are what you eat. But that's really not it. it, it, it you are what you think, really. I mean, that's the, the basis of it. No proverb put it this way. And you've probably heard it before. You sow a thought, you reap an act. You sow an act, you reap a habit. You sow a habit, you reap a character. You sow a character, you reap a destiny. But you notice the beginning, the, the very beginning is the thought life. It's the mind. So if we're going to win these mind games that we're going to talk about this coming month and, and what he's trying to play with us, we must realize the lies that he tries to feed us. We need to name them for what they are and know how to combat them. So we're going to use the book of Philippians and, and walk our way through that starting this week. Um, but let's first talk about the, the idea that Satan kind of wants to hijack our mind and talk about that a little bit more. Um, because our God-given purpose is given uh, by God, and he wants to take that purpose and make it something different. Um, he wants to corrupt our mind, to get us, divert us off the path, and he, he darkens our ways. If you look at 2 Corinthians 4, 4, he says, Whose minds the God of this age has what? Blinded. Who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. So the reason that oftentimes we get messed up is because we, we, we're kind of blinded uh, by, by his, literally, he put, he, we're flying blind because of what he does in giving us false purposes and, and false direction in our life. And he says in 1 Corinthians 2, 4, he says, The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, for nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. We can't see spiritual truth. We're, we're literally blinded to it. He blinds us to that. And Jesus said, as he talked to us about us being blind, and he said, and this is the condemnation, that the light has come to the, uh, into the world, but men love what? They love darkness more than light. And that's why we can't see. Our deeds are evil. We don't want to see the light. We don't want it to be shed upon us. And for everyone, he says, practicing evil hates the light, does not come to the light, lest their deeds should be exposed. So in this world, there is darkness it's not because the light isn't available. It's not because it's not here. It's because we would rather believe the lies of darkness. So as you're sitting here today and we're thinking and we're exploring these things, these lies that are out there, let us pray right to begin with that God will help us to see the light and not, not be covered up by the lies and say, oh, I'm, I wish so-and-so was here to hear this or this doesn't affect me. Let's pray right now that God open our eyes to, to the light. Lord, we know that Satan is the great deceiver. You've, you've told us that from the beginning. He would, would have us go astray. He would have us to believe things that are not the truth. He would have us to believe that our lives aren't meaningful, that we don't really have a purpose, and the purposes that he provides for us. Many of us are following uh, heavily right now. We're going after. And I pray that you'd help us to see if we're going on the wrong track today, that your spirit would reveal that to us that we might see the real purposes that you have for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. He provides many false uh, purposes. One is materialism, which really is, is selfishness. The, the desire to have, to get more, it becomes our focus. It becomes, if you will, a false prophet and a false purpose. Um, the drive is based on Satan's lies that the more you get, what's going to happen? The happier you'll be. You know, the more you own, the happier you are going to be, the more important, the more fulfilled life is going to be. Now, we know that our value is not determined by what we have, though, don't we? Uh, we, we know that. Uh, we know that things on, only provide temporary happiness, and that real joy comes from our relationship with God. We know that there's no real security in things. It can all be taken away, just like that. Doesn't matter what we have, our job, our homes. Um, everything you think of can be gone just in a matter of moments. Jesus warned us against it. Look what he said. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon where? Earth. 
Moth and rust does corrupt. Thieves break in and steal. Lay up for yourselves treasures where? In heaven. Where neither moth and rust does corrupt nor break in and steal. Thieves don't. Where your treasure is, what's he say? There your heart's going to be also. So I ask you, where is your treasure? Has he given you a false purpose in life to reach after the things, materialism? Is, is that the purpose that you drive for? What you get up for in the morning? Uh, if so, you're following after his life. Secondly, guilt. Now, this made you think, well, what a, how would that be a false purpose? Well, the devil rehashes in our minds past memories of mistakes and sins and failures and foul-ups and all the things that we've done wrong in our life. He, he just loves rehashing it. So guilt-driven people often allow our past to control us. Uh, we spend a lot of time, this productive energy, dealing with regrets and worrying over sins and hiding in shame. And we don't even know how to relieve that, that burden of guilt oftentimes because he, he blinds us to that, to even see in Jesus and the blood of Christ that can relieve it. If we could only turn to God and turn over the offenses to him. You know, God has told us if we're in Christ that we're a new what? Creation. New creation. He's made us new. In every, the old is gone. And so we need to remember. We need to rebuke Satan and say, no, that is not that's not where I'm at. I've been forgiven. I remember the blood of Christ that was shed for me. I'm a new creation in Christ. And those sins, they've been, they've, we've been forgiven of those. Amen? As a Christian, we have been. So don't let guilt drive you. Turn over to the driver's chair to always thinking about what could have been and what I did wrong in, in years in the past. The third one is hatred. The devil uses this purpose oftentimes to hide God's purpose, which is love. Just the opposite. Many times we don't forgive, nor do we forget. We enjoy being angry. We enjoy resenting other people. Uh, we rehearse how others have wronged us over and over in our minds until there's, there's bitterness. And there's a need for revenge. And it's, it's always popping up in our minds. Some of us have temper tantrums. And we've blown our tops. And, and then we regret doing that. So we're dealing with both of these purposes in our life. But yet then we try to justify that we, we've gotten angry because... They deserved it or whatever. And then it starts festering. Then we have health concerns as well as a broken relationship with someone else. And then a broken relationship with God. And, and it just snowballs. That's what hate does. There's also sometimes a deep down anger towards God. And what I mean by this is when things don't go well in our life. When something's gone wrong. Maybe we thought that it was going to go this way. And it didn't. And our lives have taken a different path. And we, in some ways, blame God for it. We don't say it, but we really do. You know, I think about what Jeremiah said. Jeremiah said, why was I ever born? My entire life has been filled with trouble and sorrow and shame. And so there's an anger that there's an inability for us to control our lives. And it really, we're frustrated that God has allowed things like this to happen to us. And we can always hear the frustration in Jeremiah's voice here. Some of you Star Wars fans can remember in episode two in Star Wars, there was a young, gifted uh, Jedi. His name was, oh, come on, I know there's Star Wars fans here, Anakin Skywalker. He returns to his home planet, and as a young adult, he's visiting his mother there, and he learns that she's been abducted. He finds her, however, she's so badly mistreated that she dies just a few minutes later uh, in his arms. He's filled with rage, and he doesn't just take out revenge on those that... that took the life of his mother. He massacred the, all of them. The women, children, everyone. That uncontrolled outburst is the beginning of Anakin's journey to the dark side. And eventually becomes who? Darth Vader. Uh, we know from old uh, Star Wars fans that we were talking about this the past week when seeing the original Star Wars Tell My Age at theater. James 1, 20 says, Man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. You see, if your life is overshadowed by anger, then that becomes your purpose. Living out of anger is a dangerous way to live, isn't it? You know, we need to remember uh, that resentment, that hatred always hurts the one that has it more than it hurts the, the one that it's against. That's why Ephesians 4.31, we mentioned last week, Colossians 3.8 says, get rid of anger, bitterness, rage, or to do that. God realizes anger is going to destroy us if we let it take heart. Don't let your life be driven by anger. Love is the opposite path that we'll talk about. Then there's need for approval. 
You know, the devil takes a natural desire for us to, to try to meet the approval or need the approval of our, our master who is in heaven. And he gets us to turn that around with expectations of parents and children and employers and teachers and friends that we have around us. Peer pressure, it drives so many people today. Now, we oftentimes think about young people that are, are following the crowd but, and trying to fit in. It comes to maybe premarital sex or alcohol, drugs or the language they use and things like that. And that's true. It is a, a, a big driver. But it's also true of many adults. Many adults are still trying to earn uh, the approval of unpleasable parents, of people in their life that can't be pleased. Someone once said, being controlled by the opinions of others is a guaranteed way to miss God's purposes in your life. And it's for sure. God's opinion of me is what needs to be the most important, isn't it? What God thinks. We serve an audience of one, and that's God. One day, our knees will personally bow before the Lord. And it, it's up to us then. We'll, we'll bow before him, not before our peers, not before anybody else. Jesus told us to seek ye first what? His kingdom and his righteousness. So the question is, are we trying to win the approval of other people or the approval of God? Paul asked the same question. Galatians 1.10, he says, am I now trying to win the approval of men or of God? Or am I trying to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. And so the devil would have us to try to be a people pleaser, to fit in and, and try to win the approval of all those around us. You know, can you really do that? You know what, you can't. You know, if you fit in this group, then this other group's not going to like you. You know, you can't really please all people. There's no way to do that. But we need to make sure we're pleasing God and Him alone. Now, the next one is the pleasure or lust of the eyes. The devil has blinded so many with the false purposes and this meaning for our lives that so many times our lives are solely driven by, by the moment. Whatever turns us on, whatever that is right there. The Bible calls that the lust of the eyes. He says, take care of your body because of that. Many times we say, nah, I don't know about taking care of my body. I'm going to do whatever I want to do. So we chase after things that we abuse our bodies. We desecrate our bodies. And the Bible calls that, you know, when we do that, we sin against our own body. The Bible says, you know, save sex for the covenant of marriage. We say, no, nah, I'm going to do whatever I want to. We live like an animal in heat. Uh, just like when we buy into that we are animals, basically. Do whatever you want, whenever you want. Um, or whatever you want, whenever you want. The Bible says, take care of your body. But we don't do that. Solomon, the wisest who ever lived, was he a, a person that restrained himself? No. Not quite. You know, we look at what he, what he had, and oftentimes we get caught up in that. He had 900 wives and slave girls as his harem. So he had, he had plenty of, of ladies around him. He had everything that is beyond your imagination as far as material things that were there, his own vineyards and, and great projects and castle, you name it. He had everything. Listen to his words. The wisest of the wise. He said, I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. Anything he looked upon, he went after. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my work, and this was the reward of all my labor. He says, yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was what? meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. Learn from the wisest of the wise. You know, when God created us, he gave us free will. We go back to the Garden of Eden. It didn't take long before he said, you can have of every tree, everyone in here except that one. And what did we do? We went for that one. It's like you got a park there and there's park benches everywhere and there's one that says wet paint. And what do we want to do? Is it really wet? <laughs> Want to go touch it, you know, to find out. Just what he's told us not to do. He says, eat from any of the trees except for this one. And they had to get a bite from that one. And why? Because the Bible says it was pleasing to, again, the eye, again. Now, the time of Noah, the Bible says, the Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. So oftentimes we're driven by pleasure, by the things of the eye, of the moment. Uh, and we don't think about the consequences. And we don't think about what, the way God should have us 
to go after the things that would give us true pleasure in our life. In his time, he protects us from so many heartaches if we'd only listen to him. The last one is power and success. That's a, a, a lie that's motivated by Satan, and it, it's very real for many people. Many people seem to think only thing's going to matter in life is I climb the, the ladder. I get a, a better job. I achieve some type of greatness. I want to look good to other people so they, I would be the envy of them, and they could look at me and see where I've achieved and what I've done. And it don't matter who we step on to get ahead, but just so we get there. And to them, success, maybe to us, success equals happiness. Success is purpose in life. And those who achieve, maybe the power that they desire, they're never satisfied because you always want what? Want more. Uh, and, and that feeling of importance is there. It doesn't provide the joy or purpose that you thought it would. Now, the most people who are most susceptible to this are, are those that are really person, type A personalities and those that are workaholics. And there's nothing wrong with giving your best, giving 100%, striving for excellence. God, he smiles at that when we do that. But when our career, our position, knocks God off of the throne of our heart, that's when the problem is, isn't it? When that becomes God and, and God is no longer God. And that becomes the driver in our life. Success has become our God then. And what a sad, temporary, incomplete God that will be. It's ironic that Jesus says the last will be first and the first will be last. He said, I didn't come uh, to be served, but to, to serve. He tells us, serve one another. We're called by Paul. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. In humility, consider others better than yourselves. Each of you look not to your own interest, but the interest of others. So success in God's view is very different from the lie that Satan would have us paint um, that we brought in this generation. Now, these, these purposes that Satan would throw out there to us, they are very tiresome. They're unfulfilling. They're uncontrollable. They're useless. And once we even get what we want, we realize that doesn't bring me the, the meaning in my life that I thought it would. It's undesirable. And many of you are here today, you could testify to that because you've tried many of these things. And, and you've been down that alley. And you'd say, yeah, if I could only tap them in the shoulder and say... Hey, hey, don't do that. It's, it's not going to bring you what you think. I'm reminded of the story told about two Jews that went into a, a German uh, prison camp. And they, one faced starvation, faced the, the horrible sanitary conditions and freezing cold. He faced it with hope and trust. The other faced the same situation, but with despair and hopelessness. What was the difference? Same conditions, but different outlook. One saw the stars through the bars. And the other focused on the bars that were there. One looked beyond their present condition to what could be with hope for tomorrow. And the other only saw what was current, present. The hardship, the difficulty was there. One lived with that, one in that freedom that was there. Now I believe, as we read on in the story, one actually lived and the other died. You probably know which one it was. I believe that today many are behind the bars of false purposes. We've been shackled, if you will, with no real hope, no real purpose in our life because these things don't provide that. Once we go down that alley, we think we've got it, and, and then we just still feel empty. Something's missing right here. Well, why is that? It's because Satan has fooled us to put so much time and effort in that. We've been blinded by Satan to go after those things. We need to look for the stars beyond those bars that are shackled us and the benefits of finding true purpose. So God wants to reveal his God-given purpose to us. And before God can truly do that, for them to take root, to take meaning, God needs to control your mind. Now, how does that happen? That's not an easy thing, is it? You know, I hope we see that, we're, again, we're in this war that we're fighting. And the battle, this is one battle we cannot afford to lose. We cannot. Because the only way that you're going to get in control of your mind is that God can help you. Get control of your mind. Um, now, someone once put it like this. He that will not command his thoughts will soon lose command of his actions. Our President Woodrow Wilson said that. Now, the good news is we don't fight this war empty-handed. Let's look back at the text and read again this time from the New American Standard. He says in 2 Corinthians 10, he said, For the weapons of our warfare are not of flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. 
We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we're taking every thought captive in obedience to Christ. Think about it. God wants us to take captivity to our thought life. That can't be done with physical weapons, but only with spiritual ones. There are things we need to learn that we can guard our minds and, and against the attacks that the devil would have against us. How do we win that battle? How do we learn to say no to all those false purposes that we've been talking about and saying yes to God's purposes? One, refocus your mind. Refocus it. Colossians 3, 2 says, set your mind on things where? Above. You know, it's a wonderful thing to realize that we can indeed determine the direction of our minds. Romans 8, 6 says, to be spiritually minded is life and peace. What does it mean to be spiritually minded? It simply means that the Holy Spirit is always pushing thoughts of God in our mind to the forefront. No matter, you know, whichever way, if you've got a compass and whichever way you turn it. You ever tried to turn, make a compass turn in the wrong direction? As a kid, maybe you think, I'm going to make it mess up. I know I can. You know, that, that needle always does what? Always goes back to the north, you know, and and that's the way it is with the Holy Spirit. If we're truly spirit filled and we're trying, the spirit is going to keep trying to impact our minds and our thinking no matter what way we turn. Similarly, we're, when we're like that, you know, we can think that our mind is going to turn to God. So we're spiritually minded. We refocus the mind on things of the spirit. We refill the mind. Secondly, we you know we fill it, our minds with godly thoughts. You may think that's impossible. But think about this. You take a, an empty glass. What do I do to get the air out of it? You pour water in it. Pour something in it to fill it. And the air comes out. You know, It's the same way. Is it possible to remove the dirtiness, the distortion, the deceptions from our mind? Yes, it is. Absolutely. By filling our minds with the things of God. We're going to do this scripture in a few weeks. But look at Philippians 4.8. He tells us about what to think about. Those things that are true and noble and just and pure and, and lovely. If anything be excellent or praiseworthy, just think about these things. You see, the key to controlling your mind is not trying to thought, think, okay, I'm not going to think bad thoughts. I'm not going to think bad thoughts. That doesn't work, does it? No, it doesn't. Because what happens? We, we continually, he wants to throw. But if we fill our mind with positive things of God, then it does work. The greatest way to do that is to saturate your mind. No wonder the psalmist said, you know, your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against God. So when we fill our minds with those things. The word hidden means to store up, to load up, you know, so much so that you can't get anything else in it. Anybody ever mess with a computer or maybe even your cell phone and you've got so much stuff in it, if you added one more thing, it would be completely full, you know. And that's the idea. We load our minds with so many things of God that the devil can't get his stuff in there because our minds are full. Then we renew the mind. The Bible clearly says that no matter how dirty, how distorted, how deceived, how damaged our minds are, it can be renewed. That's hope for you and me today, isn't it? Do you think, well, the devil's got control of my mind right now, preacher. You know, I, I don't know what I can do about that. He says you can have your mind renewed. Look at Ephesians 4.22. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. It can be done. Romans 12.2 says, though, it's a process by we're transformed. By the renewing of our mind, an ongoing process that we seek to fulfill the purposes of God, that we continually have it renewed. It's not a one-time thing. You don't go to church one time and oh, I got my mind filled. I'm done for the done for the year. You know, it's a continual thing, isn't it? We're continually getting in the Word. We're into Bible studies. We're trying to do our daily devotions. We're praying. We're listening to people that that are godly. We're hanging around with godly. It's a continual thing by the transforming of our mind that the negative things won't be there. We find purpose. We go to the book of Philippians in these things as we kind of close up today. And these are not anything that's new to you. You know these are your purposes in life. It's interesting to me that we can find all five that I see that are our main purposes in life right in the, the first chapter of Philippians. One is to love others. Look what he says in Philippians 1. I thank my God every time I remember you. And all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day till now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you since I have you in my heart. Paul's saying, I love you. And we love others in Christ. Isn't it interesting? What did Jesus say the first and the second greatest commandment was? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor yourself. 
So one of the very first verses we find, Paul says, hey, here's your purpose. Make sure you're loving others the way I love you. I love you with all my heart. You're in my mind all the time. So we love other people instead of loving self, instead of always thinking about how to do self. We've got our mind on others. See the difference in the lies. Look at the second thing, worshiping Christ. We find <clears throat> he's, right away he says, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel. This is my prayer that you may love may abound more and more in the knowledge of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and the praise of God. He reminds them that our lives were built for worship, that we were built to lift God up. He's reminding them that that's our purpose, not to lift ourselves up, not to say how much we gained in this life, and, and not to, to look at the things of the world, but to, to worship God, our audience of one. He reminds them that's our purpose. And then we look at a few verses down. He says in verse 6, Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ. That you're, you're working and serving Christ. He says, I'm in chains for Christ because I serve him. It's not just a matter of words. It's doing as well that I'm willing to put my life on the line to serve Christ. And that's what we need to be willing to do. To be willing to stand up for him. In, in every situation, to serve him with all that we have, all that we've been given, our gifts and talents, into, into Jesus Christ. And then, pretty obvious in verses 21 through 24, that we imitate Christ. He says, for to me to live is, is Christ. Man, how, doesn't that look good on the tombstone? For me to live is Christ. And to die is what? Is gain. And he says, if I'm going to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. But what shall I choose? I don't know. He, he said, I'm torn between the two. I desire to part and be with Christ. He wanted so much to be with Christ, which is better by far. But it's necessary, more necessary for me to remain in the body. Because he's imitating. He's always saying, he's follow my example as I follow Christ. He's imitating Christ, so those around him, the young believers, he's got the new church there uh, in, in Philippi. Follow my example. Those of you who's helping in Corinth, follow my example as I imitate Christ. I've always said, you know, that you've got people watching you, even though you don't know it. You believe that? Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, whether you've got children or grandchildren, your peers at work, your friends at school, you know, people are watching. They are. I remember uh, one time in school, one of my friends brought that to my remembrance, and I didn't know, had any clue. She knew that I was trying to be a Christ follower, but I wasn't being a Christ follower. And she said, I'm disappointed in you. And I'm thinking, you're disappointed in me? I didn't know you knew I was a Christian, you know? But she did know. And she noticed that I wasn't following the way I needed to. So others are watching. Make sure we're imitating Christ. That's our purpose in life. And then telling others of Christ. Look what he says in the last few verses there. He says, convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. So that through my being with you, again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on my account. Your boasting, your witnessing. And he says, and because of my change, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord. They dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. What was it that Jesus said before he left? The Great Commission was to go and what? Preach and teach and baptize and disciple. That's what he says. Our Great Commission is, is to go and to tell others about Christ. These are the five purposes that should occupy our, our minds and our thoughts and our talents, our resources, not the things that Satan provides in this life. As a Christian, you need to understand as we close that our mind is originally enemy-held territory. That he is there, and, and Colossians 1.21 says you were once alienated, you were enemies of God. Satan had control, and he doesn't want to give up that, does he? He wants to storm the citadel of your mind, to storm it. And when you become a Christian, because uh, he wants to break down the wall, he wants to get back in there. The devil doesn't give up. He keeps, he keeps attacking and going at us, um, and he won't give up without a fight. You know, it's, it's easy to be a, a soldier in a parade. You know, I've, I've not done it, but uh, you can look at the soldiers and you see, okay, they keep in step. They've got weapons they're on their shoulders, you know, but perhaps most of the time I think they're not loaded, you know, and sometimes they're even just for show. Um, the weapons aren't real weapons. And so it's kind of easy to be a soldier in a parade, 
But you think about it, you're in a war. Uh, you're, you're carrying a loaded weapon. And, and is it easy if you're on the front lines? Certainly not. You're fighting in combat for your life. And I wonder for us as Christians, if we may think that we're in a parade instead of a war. We come to church and we sing some nice songs and we hear a nice little message and uh, we have communion and then we go back out in the world and we do things like we want to do. And we're just kind of in a parade. We forget that we're in a war. Your, your mind is a battleground right now. And the devil's telling you don't pay attention to what I'm saying. That's the battle going on right now. But if we're in a war, and that war, there's no wonder we see so many spiritual casualties across the battlefields because folks think they're in a parade. We don't understand that there's a battle going on for your soul, for your heart, for your mind right now as Satan is attacking relentlessly with the purposes that we laid out there in the beginning. And he's already sucked many of us right in and thinking, yeah, he, this is fulfillment, this is life. And then when it gets down to the end of life, then we suddenly realize that's not what it is. Or we get to where we think we thought we should be and we realize that's not the purpose. So we follow another lie down another path. And he diverts us from our real purposes. We look at what scripture says to us. You've heard me use this verse many times as we close here. We fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen, he says, is eternal. Satan has aimed his heaviest artillery at your mind. He's attacking, and he's doing it relentlessly. We combat that by keeping our minds, our focus on Jesus Christ. We keep our minds on things that are eternal, not things that are temporal, that are here. You know, you heard me say it many times. There's no U-Hauls behind a hearse. I'm not going to take it with us. And you're not going to take your power and prestige uh, into heaven. You're not going to take any of the, the pleasures they have here. They're going to mean a thing. When we, we get, kneel down before the Lord, it's not going to mean anything. Only what's going to matter is what we've done for, for Him and for God. We'll close with prayer and then we'll have our invitation time today. Maybe you're already a Christian, but he's been, he's been pulling the wool over your eyes. He's blinded you. He's a great deceiver. And I, I think if we had to raise a hand here today, I think probably if you were truthful, everybody would raise your hand and say, He's deceived me at some time in my life. Amen? Amen. He deceives us so readily. If you're being deceived today, but make sure you call it for what it is. Name it, what he's doing to you. And we pray, Lord, to take it away. Lord, we just ask you today that we have our minds opened, our spirits open, that your spirit may prick us to understand that there's a battle going on for our lives, for the purpose, for the meaning of our life. We may be going down the wrong path, Lord, and we, I pray that you would help us to realize if that's true. Help us, Lord, to seek the true meaning for life, which is worshiping and honoring you, serving you, imitating you, and telling others about you, making sure, Father, that we're loving others as you've loved us. We're thankful, Father, that you provided us guidance. Help us, Lord, to follow strongly after you. Help us to put up a battle for our minds that Satan would have us to control. We're thankful, Lord, that with your weapons we can win. We are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus our Lord. And we claim that today. Help us, Lord. If there's a decision needs to be made today, whether someone to come to you for the first time, or somebody to rededicate, or prayer for them in their seat, or decide to go in a different direction they're going, I pray that you'd help them to have the spirit-led drive in their lives to, to make that decision. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together and sing our closing today. Our chains are gone.
service tonight because of Labor Day weekend, so spend time with your family. Uh, Grandparents Day is next Sunday night, so remember that. It's at 6 o'clock. I think there's some sign-ups out there for snacks and things like that, and so uh, this is not just for, um, you know, folks that are here. Grandparents come, invite your grandparents, um, you know, those type of things. We want to have a good good turnout the next Sunday night, and we'll be doing some special things with the, the kids at night as well. This coming Friday night is the uh, Eastern North Carolina Summer Banquet. Uh, they'll, we have Cam Huxford as a, as a great speaker. He'll be there. They're also presenting Kevin and Maya as um, the new church planners, which will be in our area. So they'll be there that night as well. Uh, we'll be taking the bus from here. I need to let them know probably about Wednesday. So if you sign up today or at least call in the office, and I'll let them know the numbers we have going uh, to go over that night. Uh, it is free. Uh, Eastern, North, Eastern North Carolina Men's Fellowship is taking care of the, the meal and everything like that. So any other announcements before we close? Mr. Glenn? Yes. Flag practice after Sunday school. And did you appreciate our flags this morning? Amen? Yeah, thank you guys so much. That's our worship in that way. We appreciate that. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your blessings. Thank you for this day. We come to, to honor and worship you. We pray, Lord, that things have been pleasing in your sight, that you'd help us, Lord, uh, to take Christ to those that we meet this week, that we might be the church to people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.